Hello everyone. Welcome to the Get in the Mode YouTube channel where we talk about self mastery and innovation. This episode of the podcast is slightly different from what we have done previously. We want to kick off a new series called Book Talk. In this series, we dive into books and the concepts they explore. books that speak to self mastery and innovation today i'm joined by my very good friend jessica and we talk about a controversial book called the end of trauma we believe this book is controversial to our times in the last few decades we have equated all struggle and life's unexpected mishaps to trauma it is fashionable to be and remain in therapy jessica has read this book and she will share what really attracted to her her to this book and how it is controversial i give you jessica rink welcome to book talk jessica welcome to the youtube channel Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome. Well, um for the benefit of our audience, um can you start by telling a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So Jessica Rink, I am a business intuition coach. I know it's a very strange title, but I personally believe that every single one of us is highly intuitive. It's a function of our brain that um when fully tapped into creates a lot of mastery in how we approach our lives not only with our health but our wealth and our leadership capacity so that's what i coach executives and ceos and how to tap into their intuition and achieve certain levels of mastery in their own business great well um for this uh talk um we've chosen the book the end of trauma yeah um let's start there um first i want to understand how did you arrive like where did you see it did somebody recommend this to you what drew you to this book i am an avid kindle reader in fact kindle's telling me that i have an unbroken streak of about 5 years so i'm really proud of that um but with this book it came up as a suggestion based upon other books that i had read and i really enjoyed the title the end of trauma because i really believe that trauma is a term we're starting to throw around a bit too much in our society that while it's it's healthy to look at the past and determine in what events have shaped me and and what events were really problematic in my life i see a lot of people saying oh this is my trauma that's my trauma and and mike personal concerns about that were what what are we labeling ourselves with when we're constantly referring back to these super painful events that we can't ourselves seem to get over. And so what what drew me to that title was like a uh, clinical psychologist I really liked his cred- credentials and his uh back cover and I just thought man the end of trauma what does this guy have to say and it ended up being a very very interesting book and a very not disappointing read. <laughs> Awesome. Well, back cover is that the design or something that he wrote in the back cover? Just something that he wrote in the back cover. Yep. <laughs> you know, one thing that I we all in this uh, you know, sort of information age, social media and everything, like reading a book cover to cover is a lost art. You know, it's it's like when you said back cover, I I I was reminded of that and you know how many times do we drop books and sometimes rightfully so like you get the gist and like okay it's repetition but um a lot of times it's our distraction we find something you know like you said kindle recommends something new or our friends recommend something else and then we go to the bookstore and see something and it's all kinds of distractions and then even if you pick up something to read then you're checking your phone for tons of other things you know right uh, isn't it is it do you do you ever feel that way <laughs> is that a I, thing for you i do take quite a few books to the finish line but but i also will say that i've got a whole bookshelf of works in progress 
Got it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, you as an avid reader, I, I can kind of, you know, me too is like, I can relate to that. It's like, you're always reading, you know, five to 10 books at a time and, you know, just multitasking and depending on what do you feel like reading that day? You, you know, you pick up and read, you know, um, absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, let's uh, dive into this book a little bit. Um, I'm assuming you read this cover to cover. So um, th that's great. Um, so with that, I want to, if you can walk us through sort of like the landscape of the book, you know, what are some of the overview, overarching things that, that, that the book is saying, perhaps some of the key points, uh, if you can walk us through that, that'd be great. You bet. Well, he starts off, again, clinical psychologist seems to be based out of the New York area, um, very well versed in, in his field, but also brings forward a bit of the problems, especially relating to aspects of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. He says that PTSD is a relatively new concept that within the last hundred or so years, we've defined what PTSD is. We've given it a clinical diagnosis according to the DSM, uh, which is the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, I think, that deals with um, how we define mental health disorders. Got it. So PTSD being something that's relatively new we're still building the plane as we fly it with determining what is a symptom of PTSD, what is a symptom of trauma run amok in, in an individual's mind. And so, of course, we think of soldiers. And what was really interesting was that he brings forward the first time ancient literature mentioned something that could be talked about as PTSD, and that was in the Iliad. And when Homer describes this horrific battle scene and how all of these soldiers were having such a hard time coping and their minds were fractured at the end of it, it's basically uh, colloquially how we would define PTSD today. But he states that the concept of psychological trauma is relatively new. And in that, I think there's this aspect where we could stand with a little... I don't want to, this is my personal view, but stand with a little bit more humility in defining such things because we're still trying to figure out how the brain works. Got it. Mm -hmm. But sort of that, like um, yeah. fair something, sorry to interrupt, but okay. sort of like a fairly recent concept. We don't have a full handle on what this is. Uh, perhaps I'm guessing with this PTSD thing uh, that you, being relatively new, is it sort of, is he saying first world war, end of that? Is that kind of the birth of this concept? Definitely. And, right. and, and how each war seems to take us deeper and deeper into the psychological makeup of something like PTSD and how it's affecting people. But interestingly, how it's affecting us generation over generation. And that has changed. Now, a bulk of the book segments between a few stories a few individuals i think it's four uh and these each of these individuals was very intimately involved in the events of 9 11 they were either in the towers or they were next to the towers or or something along those lines and so he bounces back and forth between these stories of these individuals who endured sheer hell on earth and how each of them recovered differently according to different psychological makeups and personalities. And then he has this control story of a guy who got run over, spoiler alert, he got run over by a dump truck in New York and got both of his legs mangled. And his resilience and where he should have had tremendous PTSD from his body being just taken through unreal amounts of physical trauma his mind bounced back really easily. And so he compares these four individuals and compares and contrasts of like, okay, well, this individual was at the, one of the top levels of the towers as it, you know, right before it crashed, they survived and the PTSD started to show up eventually throughout their life. And so he does this really interesting dissertation of compare and contrast and try and figure out what made each mindset different and why certain people recovered and other people didn't. So really great analysis on that. But 
to get back to the point of trauma, he says that traumatic memories are those that cycle over and over and over again, and they torment the subject's mind. And eventually that individual is going to create elaborate actions and behaviors to avoid thinking about those traumatic memories or avoid anything that would even remind them remotely of those traumatic memories, like they would avoid a certain place if a restaurant looked like something in that experience or if a person reminded them of it. So eventually this person continues to make their life smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until that PTSD symptomology or symptomatic aspects is completely taken over their lives. And they're at a very unpredictable and highly hypervigilant state of being. Got it. So he argues, and this is a bit reductive because he has a lot of great points, but he argues that in some levels, instability is needed in our life for growth. He likens it to a forest and that in a forest landscape, if we were to look at it on the whole, that's a very unstable environment. There's all kinds of things happening and and eventually the forest fire rips through there, which could be likened to a very traumatic event. And the forest then has to regrow itself. And so this is where the book started to turn a little bit and why I personally loved it was that when we're talking about trauma and PTSD, let's not forget the point. Let's not forget the point that that trauma and that horrific experience did grow us in some ways. And it is up to the mind and the individual to cultivate a resilience and a flexibility in in mitigating themselves out of that with the help of therapists and tools and, and all kinds of really good methodology that it he himself is a big proponent of obviously as a therapist um another point that i thought was very interesting was that we're so invested in the search for meaning and this is a really good thing for people who are maybe perhaps at that point of self actualization what is the meaning what is the purpose behind all of these things but if you get run over by a truck <laughs> and both of your legs are mangled what kind of meaning could one really derive out of that? And, and is that function of man's incessant search for meaning helpful at that point? And he would argue, no, that in that point, it's more meaningful than to search for problem solution, to pull yourself out of that state, to really lend to uh, a new type of growth and flexibility and mindset and just solve the immediate problem. I need to learn how to walk again. I need to learn how to live my life with this situation now. And then perhaps once the system or the forest stabilizes, we can get back to a space of now let's go back to the search for meaning. I just thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I will say trigger warning, reading stories of 9-11 in that amount of detail was incredibly difficult. And I think it, it was a... a you know, we've been a couple decades removed from that event. I thought it was a nice, for what it is, reminder of of how certain people have suffered, and that it bring, brings forward a lot of empathy, but also a lot of um, we can do something about this. And I think as we our society continues to be involved in some pretty interesting conflicts worldwide and conflicts at home and and all of that, we we've got some significant challenges ahead of us, and using some of these points in this book, can we start to focus on resilience? Can we start to focus on our on our flexibility, how we talk to ourselves internally? Can we pull ourselves out of the worst situations imaginable and, and turn them into, you know, steps to our own pathway of glory? So all in all, a very inspiring book, fairly quick read as well, but I highly recommend it for pages? people. That's an excellent question. Kindle will probably tell me one answer and a paper book would probably That's tell true. me another. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, how, how long did it take you to complete the book? That's a weekend book. Okay. A couple of days. Yep. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, well, thanks for that great summary. A um, okay. couple of things that are interesting in that, uh, but I'll pick up on one. Um, I, my, I don't have, a lot of reading in the psychoanalysis or psychology. I mean, except for Freud, I would argue that he's more a philosopher than a psychoanalyst. But the idea of existence um, on, you know, this life that we call existence is sort of a struggle. I mean, 
it, there, yes, there is beauty in this world. Yes, you know, there's love and everything is there. But at the same time, if we all led a struggle-free life, um, it, uh, I wonder if we would have that sort of, you know, like reward and satisfaction and fulfillment uh, in our lives. You know, the, and when you said something like, yeah, I'm, I'm curious how is he, is he showing different people approaching it with different perspectives on the mishaps that happen in their life? You know, can you expand on that? I'm, I'm, I'm curious what he says there. You bet. I think he does, if I recall correctly, he does look at the behaviors uh, associated with people who, especially the ones after the 9-11 event. So-and-so went back to work. So-and-so collapsed and couldn't engage with people for a few months. And then another person did X, Y, Z. I don't remember specifically. But then there's an aspect and a lot of questions of, of what's going on in the mental landscape with these people and the emotional landscape. Why did the guy who got run over by a truck recover so fine? And in fact, reflexively, him looking at his own thoughts, even himself questioning, why am I okay? Why am I doing okay? This makes zero sense. And then the person who isolated for months on end after 9-11, maybe not as reflexively, just could not deal with the reality outside of her doors. And so I think... He, he goes back and forth a bit to behavior versus the internal landscape, internal self-talk. And I think reflexive, reflexively thinking about thinking <laughs> Got it. is a really good aspect that we could all bring forward for ourselves as well. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny, like somebody just said it in a, in a very short phrase that I heard. Um, you don't learn from life experiences. You learn from reflection on those life experiences. You know, like we always think like, oh, that's that happened to me. It's I'm learning, you know. No, unless you, you know, unless you reflect, you're not going to learn, right? Um, I, I wonder, is that sort of like what he's sort of picking up on? Like, you know, retroactively looking at it and then, okay, you know, how do I pick up and move? keep going yeah certainly not his main point i think but it's definitely in there got it okay yeah and, and i wonder is there any difference in terms of like the inter like um per perhaps the innate you know um things that you that a certain a sentiment or a certain orientation of the mindset that does that is that innate or can that be developed? I'm, I'm curious if he touches on that. Well, the bulk of his book is really centered on a flexible mindset, flexibility. And he differentiates that from a growth mindset in that the growth mindset seeks to learn and expand. Flexible mindset is... Uh, he defines it in such a way that convinces we're able to convince ourselves that we have the ability to adapt and flex in my house we call it flexi roly yeah <laughs> to any circumstance that life may present to us yeah now there would be some underlying themes of extreme resilience in that you would have to have a level of confidence in yourself and your own abilities to be able to say i have a flexible mindset i can handle anything that life throws at me reflexively looking back and asking your mind to make that true would be a really good idea. Brain, show me how I've been flexible in the past. And the brain could call that forward. Um, so in terms of a flexibility mindset, he he hearkens on that a lot. And he teaches quite a bit about what to do to cultivate flexibility. Any key points there? Like, I love that distinction between flexible mindset and the growth mindset. You know, we always hear about the growth mindset, all, especially it's popular among the coaches, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How to develop a growth mindset. But I'm curious if you remember anything about that pliability, that plasticity. Yeah, plasticity I've, of I've this. got a 
quote here is perfect. The flexibility mindset is essentially a conviction that we will be able to adapt ourselves to the challenge at hand, that we will do whatever is needed to move forward. At the core of the mindset are three interrelated beliefs, optimism about the future, confidence in our ability to cope, and a willingness to think about a threat as a challenge. Got it. I love that last one. That's, um, you know, sort of like I almost strive on those, thrive on those challenges. Like I want those challenges. Otherwise, life sort of becomes boring, you know? Um, yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm curious. It, it's a li- I'm picking up some controversial thoughts here. You know, what differentiates this book from perhaps any other book on trauma or therapy and, you know, those type of things? A good question. You know, there's there's a lot of books that glorify trauma in in a in a hidden way. You know, there's and and not to name any book specifically, but if any book doesn't tend to offer some solutions for the trauma, but basically is more of an investigative, this is what trauma is, this is what it does to affect your life. Those are really good informational books to just have you been traumatized? <laughs> a reader can reflect and and probably argue, yeah, I've been through quite a few events that were larger than my nervous system's capacity to handle, which is basically the definition of trauma. And 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 we reflect on that. And that is probably a very healthy exercise, but it should not stop there. Yeah. To simply say that trauma just exists, and oh well, there's nothing I can do about it. That would be a uh, a, a tragedy to that individual because they would be leaving so much of themselves on the table. Yeah. You, you know, that, that is actually sort of extremely controversial, especially very different from what we hear in the popular psychology space uh, where everything is labeled, gets labeled as trauma. Oh, and even among the books, Again, I'm not going to get into the names, the books or, you know, but I almost feel like they want to keep you there in the trauma, you know, like reflecting on your trauma. Like, in fact, it should be the opposite. It should be a freeing force. Yes. And, and that's what I like about the title of this book. Like, it's like the end. It's over. You know, it's not <laughs> like, let's not keep you there. <laughs> you know, but That's what it, attracted me to it as well. In the clients that I coach, they're, you know, personal development is a wonderful thing and it, it requires us to unpeel the layers and unfold what's really deep hidden inside. But I meet so many people at certain stages of their personal development journey where they're addicted to the struggle and they're addicted to tearing themselves apart to try and find that next thing to fix. And in my practice, I, 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 very strongly argue against that at some point personal development can become toxic and it is your responsibility to say you know what i think i've done a good job developing this and i'm going to close the book right <laughs> and move forward and determine that the point of all the trauma that i the subject has gone through was to generate those things that i think the author does a great job ability to cope a willingness to think about a threat as a challenge and optimism about the future. Those locked in a trauma mindset do not have optimism about the future. They have existential dread. Exactly right. Yeah. Oh gosh. No, total anxiety, existential anxiety, as Soren Kierkegaard would say. It's like every move you make, maybe you are able to make some moves and then something reminds you of back of that trauma. Now you're going back and like, that optimism is kind of being pulled from under your feet. Like, you know, it's like a rug being pulled under your feet, right? So you really are on shaky grounds constantly. You know, you you just can't get a firm footing, I think. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, And, and the other sort of controversy about this, I'm curious how he approaches, uh, is it a two, author book or just one one okay um i'm I'm curious you know what's the role of therapy 
is, is there a place, you know, I don't want to dismiss that obviously, but uh, you know, I'm curious how, what, what sort of God guidelines does he offer for that? You know, that's a good question for a further uh, I'd have to dig deeper into the book to really get a definitive answer on him. But I, I think he is a proponent of therapy. What was really interesting, some random fact about 9-11 in that um, after the events, the state of New York was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a, a mental health crisis. And that was back in 2001. That was way before we even had the words mental health in our common lexicon in our society. So they prepared this, the immediate area with thousands of therapists that were on call and ready to provide their services to any New Yorker who felt they needed it. And it was totally free. The adoption of that therapeutic approach was so slim to nothing. Really? It shocked the entire industry. They were convinced that everyone's been through an insurmountable trauma. Everyone's going to need therapy. And that was not their case. And, you know, they had tons of resources that went unused. So the role of therapy, I think, really does have to be as decided by that person if it's going to help them perhaps go from the meaning stage of why did this happen to me to the problem solving stage of how do I pull myself out of this? And therapy can be a really um, helpful process to that. Being he's a clinical psychologist, I, I believe that, that he seems that therapy plays a large and prevalent role if put in the right place. Does it develop a flexibility mindset or is it keeping somebody locked in their trauma? Interesting. This sort of reminds me of another book. I'm forgetting the title of this uh, book, but it, it's sort of like this concept of uh, Freud civilization and its discontents. You know, Freud thought there's certain, you know, as civilization progresses through various, you know, economies, um, there are certain sort of like la wish fulfillment sub sometimes can be lacking. And that's sort of like, it, it, it piles up as discontents in a civilization, so to speak. So this book, the other, not Freud, um, I forget the title again, but I, the idea is there's a set of symptoms that are available to pick. It, it, it's like a, you know, think about a buffet of symptoms that are available. Again, again I'm not dismissing anybody who suffered trauma. Like I, there is folks, there are folks that have suffered, you know, there's not real or pseudo trauma, but at the same time, you know, trauma is real. But at the, the way the book talks about it is, um, I, I think, I'm not sure if it's anorexia or bulimia was not a thing in Japan. Mm -hmm. And they sent these psychologists to Japan and they sort of like interviewed a lot of women within the 25 to 35 age group and started diagnosing some of them as having, you know, bulimia or, you know, so on and so forth, eating disorders. And there were more women coming, you know, into the clinics, uh, like saying, oh, I think I've got this too. So again, I, I don't want to dismiss or, you know, the, the, it's, it's sort of like walking a fine line, right? I mean, what is sort of like available that you can pick, pick up from this buffet of symptoms versus is that a real thing for you? And I, at the end of the day, I honestly believe, it, you know, like therapy should be a freeing force. Like it should not make you live in shackles and kind of, keep coming back to therapy for more, you know, like, you know, I think uh, Freud always thought, and, and there was another guy, um, you know, Jacques Lacan would actually end the therapy. Like back in the day, therapy was 50, 50, five, zero minutes because 10 minutes they could go, you know, go to the restroom and do some things before prep, prep for the next appointment. Uh, Lacan would some do something very interesting. He would end the therapy when you sort of realize something, let's say you like, ah, I should be doing that, don't I? And then within 15 minutes, he would end that therapy right there. And 
what would happen is that person would go back and think about it. Why did he end the therapy at that point? You know, and what did I say? You know, like that, like helping them realize and kind of like ending that therapy, right? And like saying, you are good. You've realized something about yourself and, you know, time to move on. And that, that to me was very powerful. You know, when I heard that sort of a practice, it, it just kind of reminds me of that. So... Well, I love that because when the human mind gets to a point of realization or epiphanatic state, that's the point to create some action from that step. And ending the therapy would be great. You've realized it. Now go make it happen. Go seek and multiply and be fruitful or whatever. That's right. <laughs> but continuing to recycle the emotions and the feelings back into the experience, what happens to that epiphany? It might get buried. What a brilliant approach. I really appreciate that story. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about you. And uh, obviously you put, picked up this book and read cover to cover. How has it changed you? What's, uh, what's the outlook you have now after post reading this? I really appreciated having uh, the perspective of my own journey with my own traumas reflected back into this is what you've achieved as a result of all of that grinding against the process to have a flexible mindset to me and and evidenced a little bit in how the book talks about positive self-talk really affirming yourself and and being your own best champion i would also add the flexibility of being able to cycle between left brain thinking and right brain thinking really just made me optimistic about where we could be heading as a society in that does the doom and gloom need to be so prevalent? Are we moving into a place where this personal development is really serving us to a degree where we say, you know what, I've done a great job at pulling myself up out of the ashes. Now it's time to change the self-talk and say, I can do the rest of this journey with a lot of confidence and ease, hopefully. So I just thought it was really inspiring and also a sobering reminder of what some people have been through. Um, you know, again, the events of 9-11 were really, really tough to, to listen to and to read that level of detail, um, but important nevertheless. It, it expanded my capacity for empathy and uh, compassion for just the unthinkable. Yeah, it's it's. I loved how you said about the doom and gloom you know, sort of mindset versus the optimism and the flexibility, uh, you know, kind of contrasting that with this, right? And, uh, you know, whatever, and honestly, even personal development, I would argue, is not about getting, getting over your trauma. It's actually much more than that. Like, you know, like, you know, we talk about self-mastery. To me, that's, sort of like self-actualization goes more in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs territory than just kind of like, I'm traumatized. I need to, you know, seek therapy. And, you know, again, I'm not minimizing it by any chance, but, you know, but at the same time, that's going to be the space that I'm going to remain in, uh, you know, in that doom and gloom space, right? Versus sort of like developing that mindset of flexibility you know, like you said, the three things, you know, optimism. Um, what's the second one? I forgot. Uh, seeing threats as challenges. Yeah. And uh, confidence in our ability to cope. Confidence. Yeah. So um, I think sort of like that's what is going to get us to that pinnacle of that pyramid. Um, you know, Maslow never drew that pyramid, but at the same time, we all know that visualization of uh, what it means to self-actualize. Because honestly, you just cannot be a, a self-actualized, fully self-actualized person if you're remaining in that space. I, I mean, you really need to come out of that space. And granted, there's new things that's going to come up, new challenges, like you said. Uh, that's not going to go away. But, you know, realizing that is is a key point i think I, I love your key takeaways personally for you and that resonates a lot with me too thank you and i think the end 
the end of trauma really points to our ability to not be, succumb to our own traumas and call it the end of the story. But in therapeutic practices and therapeutic relationships, if someone was to enter into it with those three goals in mind, therapy to help me create optimism, confidence, and a willingness to see threats as challenges, then therapy can be an exceptionally useful tool that everybody could gain a lot from. So I hope that this is this book creates a bit of a movement. It definitely has a few tips and techniques for increasing our own flexible mindsets. Highly recommend. Awesome. Well, where can folks find you? Uh, what sort of projects are you working on? Tell us about it. Oh boy. So I am at newearthcoaching.com. Again, my practice focuses on helping business people lock into their intuition, which interestingly, intuition is a function of a balanced left and right brain. So flexibility is a very key component to intuitive self. And um, in terms of what's on the horizon, you know, getting some public speaking out there, I hope to be doing more great podcasts like this. And, uh, you know, sky's the limit, a lot more, a lot more getting out there and, and sharing my, my views on intuition with the business community. That's great. Well, Jessica, it's been a pleasure chatting with you about the book. Thanks for being on the Get In The Mode YouTube channel. It's been an honor. Thanks for having me.